Uh, welcome, friends, to this afternoon session of our monthly meeting. I hope you enjoyed your snack, snacky lunch. I hope you ate light. <laughs> because they say that it's good to have a light meal if you want to meditate. But during my snack, a question came to me. The question was, I've been talking to you earlier that all meditation, all effort is a mental game. Then why do these perfect living masters who come with the true knowledge which can only be attained by love and devotion, why do they ask us to meditate? Because they should know that meditation is only a mental game. So why do they ask us to meditate? So the answer is, it came to me, that they do this only for the sake of our mind, just to cross the hurdle of the mind, they say meditate. Our mind has been so trained, we don't know for how long it has been trained, that you can get nothing without your effort. For everything you have to struggle, and unless you work for it, struggle for it, you can't get it. So they say, okay, struggle knowing fu fully well that struggle can give you nothing spiritual. It can only give you mental things. So they make it happen because we like to do something. Supposing a perfect living master were to come into our life and say, I love you, relax, I'm taking you to your true home which you are seeking. We, we'll say, now what should we do? <laughs> what, what are we expected to do? It's a natural for the mind. So what will they say? Meditate. Okay, try. Try hard. Why do they say try hard? Because then only you will say that it doesn't work. If you try little, you say maybe I haven't done enough. And people come and tell me, maybe we have not done enough meditation, we were required to do one-tenth of our total time, two and a half hours, we couldn't do, it was very difficult. Maybe we should do more meditation. You go to masters, we couldn't complete our meditation. Do more. It's only when you have tried hard and say, it doesn't work. What works? They say, only love and devotion works on the spiritual path. That is the spiritual path, love and devotion. Two words, love and devotion. Why two words? Because we feel the love and automatically we become devoted to where the love is coming from. Devotion is a response to love. It's automatic, natural in us. So when we experience that unconditional, non-judgmental love, devotion comes automatically. And that is why they use both phrases, love and devotion, pyar bhakti, love and devotion. So you become devotees automatically when you experience that kind of love. You don't become devoted if it is merely an attachment or merely an attraction to somebody, merely a gender attraction or attraction because of other features we have. That doesn't create this kind of feeling, but pure love when it comes it makes us devotees by itself. Automatically we get that feeling. So love and devotion go together and are the secret. Somebody asked me once, if that is truly a secret, is it not a shortcut? I said, it is the best shortcut. If somebody comes and says, I have no doubt in my mind. I have no doubt. I have full faith. Can I go to my true home without meditation? My answer will be yes. A correct answer. But we don't. We don't have no doubt and full faith. We have full faith till things are going our way. <laughs> the mind is happy. Oh, everything is great. We have full faith. Tragedy occurs in your house. Faith has gone. Full faith has just disappeared. Why? Son died, husband died, so-and-so died, accident happened, I lost my limb, I did this. 
Couldn't master protect me? How can I have faith in this master? But previously day we were saying we have full faith. A little event of our life happens which is part of our destiny. And destiny can be seen, like I said in the morning, can be seen from the very origin where it's made at the causal plane and can also be seen here where we are living here. The destiny here as played out is following a certain law. We call it the law of karma. What is karma? Law of karma also created at the causal plane. Law of cause and effect. Our mind functions by dividing its decisions and actions into good and bad. Moral code is built into our minds and very often it's affected by the society we live in, the country we live in, the culture we live in, religion we live in. They lay down the rules. This is good, this is bad. And the mind accepts that. So when the mind accepts a moral code, when it tries to do things, it says, this is good, I'm happy to do it. I should be rewarded for it. And you do get rewarded. Then you say, this is bad, but it's very pleasurable, it's very nice. Okay, it's bad, one time doesn't matter. Okay, but the guilt continues. I did something bad. I deserve to be punished. I will never do it again. And we do it again and again. I often ask my audience, have you ever made a decision this particular thing I will never do again. And I still did, did, still did it again. How many of you did that? See, see, almost a universal thing. We make decisions, won't do it. What is the result of it? The more often we repeat that, the guilt level keeps on deepening in us. The guilt level starts punishing us from the very moment of the experience of guilt. And later on, the reaction comes because of the law of karma, cause and effect. You think you did good, rewarded. You think you did bad, punished. Our destiny is made up like that. Well, somebody can say, I don't want to do any bad thing. I know this law of karma, so I'm going to be very good all my life. I'll avoid everything. Very strong will is required for that. But supposing somebody does it. He will not be born here again. He will go to heaven, a lovely place in the astral plane, which you can also visit through meditation, like I explained in the morning. They are all in the astral plane, sensory plane. And you can see people enjoying themselves. And so many of them saying, why did we land up here? We want to go back to the physical plane. Why would a soul enjoy heaven like to come back here, because there is no free will there. Why has free will disappeared? Should it be just like here? No, they know what the next step is going to be, it's automatic. Here we don't know. We don't know the future at all. It's ignorance that is creating free will here. If we knew our whole destiny, that our brain will think this way only, predestined, there will be no free will. But since we don't know, the experience of free will is generated by that ignorance. And only when we have free will, we can be seekers. Only then we can find a way to go home through a perfect living master. So, that's the secret of this thing. Human life is the most precious life for that very reason. Only human life can give you the power to seek and find. All other lives are built on carrying out your destiny instinctively, automatically, autonomously. Heart is beating, nobody controls. Beat, heart beat, now stop, nobody controls, autonomous. Most of our life is autonomous. Other lives like angels in heaven and hell are all autonomous. We just go through it like a ride. If you go to an amusement park, there's a big Ferris wheel. You get out of the Ferris wheel. There's no, there is no choice you have to stop the wheel anyway. 
You have to complete a circle, then you can get out. This is how all destinies are. They create one lifetime, and one lifetime is destined to go the way it is programmed. And that is why, in spite of the fact it's predestined, every life is predestined, whether it's a tree, an insect, an animal, mammal, bird, angel, gods who they call gods running universes, all predestined also human being. But they all go with their instinct. We go with instinct plus free will, making choices. So that is why it's a unique life. Unique life, if you did all good things, you'll be in heaven. If you did all bad things, you'd be in hell. If you do a mixture of the two, you'll be human. <laughs> That's exactly why we're here. Exactly. There's nobody living that I've ever met who says, all my li life was evil, and never got a respite from it. Nor have I met somebody who says, all my life was heavenly. Everybody has ups and downs. Not only ups and downs, it looks like ups and downs come almost sequentially. Like life is like a sine curve, up and down. <coughs> and we have these phases, sometimes they last long, sometimes they last short. But we all have these, both things. And that is why this human life is very interesting roller coaster type, and we go up and down. But the beauty of it is that we have the experience of free will, and therefore the experience of seeking. When we seek, depending upon what we seek, we find. Seeking of the soul is a longing for love. That's how the seeking of the soul is met. It feels, because soul is love. They say God is love. Yes, God is love. Soul is part of God. The soul is love. But why do we have souls? If we, if God is love, what is the need of having souls? God could just operate in all of us. Why go through a transition that God should become souls and then souls should become, pick on minds and bodies and senses and work here? What made God who is love Souls. God is love, but not a lover, not a beloved. God is love. Souls are lovers and beloveds. The many were created in the one. So this, what it was, became an experience, became something to experience. There are so many things that are in a certain form, but not experiential. They become experiential. Since love became experiential at the spiritual level, it has percolated even here. We have all true love in our hearts. The mind overwhelms it, and therefore we don't experience the way it should be experienced. All of our souls are, are in love. And all souls want to be loved and love. But because the mind argues so much, creates doubts, therefore, we, oh, we are living with a life of a mind. How did we become slaves of a machine, an organic machine, like a mind given to us to use? Why was a mind given to us? To generate a new type of experience. Experience expanded in time and space. An experience that was bottled up in one moment to spread it out. Wonderful. The mind did it. The mind created conditions in which we could have a very vast different experience. And we're having it here. The mind could create experiences at different levels, sense perceptions, physical bodies, astral bodies, different astral universes, physical universes, all expanded universe. Very good machine to create all that. And on top of that, the mind was given to us, we can think. Make sense of things, make sense, sense of sense perceptions. Some people don't know that function of the mind. When we see something, for example, we see this, flowers. Is the eye seeing flowers? No, it doesn't know what flower is. What is the eye seeing? The eyes are seeing different colors and different shapes. It can't see flowers. What is making these flowers? The mind. 
the mind interprets every sense perception and makes sense of it. How does it make flowers? Out of just a combination of colors and shapes, it makes flowers because the word flower has been used several times from childbirth and every time a flower was shown, it became a flower. Eventually, the whole flower can be recognized no matter what kind of flower it is. This was explained very well by Socrates and Plato, Greek philosophers. Socrates said, every experience that the mind can have is generated from the soul. Therefore, you can't have any experience here unless generated by the soul and then put into the mind. Plato explained further. He said that the world is made up, this physical world is made up of ideas that come from the astral world. The concepts are made up in the causal world. Now imagine these three words, concept, idea, physical reality. Now let's examine actual example that Plato gives in his, in his discussions. He says, look at an example of a chair. We are all sitting on chairs, I am sitting on a chair. The word chair, does it mean this chair or that? There is a difference I notice. Word chair applies to all these chairs, how come? The idea of a chair came first, but before the idea of a chair could come, the concept that we could sit higher than the ground, because we used to sit only on the ground. The concept that you could possibly sit higher came up first. Chair, the concept that you can make a, actually stool-like a thing on which you can sit came next. And once the chair idea came, it's one idea of chair. Today thousands, millions of chairs are being made, one idea. The idea of a chair is the secret of all chairs. It did not come from here, it came from somewhere. People make great inventions. They discover new things. Where is it coming from? Oh, it's coming from their imagination. No, it's coming from the astral plane because all imagination arises from there. The world of ideas is what creates this. Who interprets it's a chair? The mind. Who looks at a chair? The eyes. All sense perceptions, they pick up senses. The mind puts them together to make sense of it and uses language to convey it. So, we have all different languages. I am calling it an English chair. In India, I call it a kursi. In other place, I call it some other name. Every language has a different name. In the astral plane, there is no name. The idea of a chair is the name. But supposing I am used to calling a chair in English, here, and I want to communicate to somebody in meditation at the astral plane. I say chair, that person doesn't speak English, speaks German, Deutsch only. <laughs> that person will hear the word a Deutsch. I speak to a person in India, they'll, I'll say chair, they won't hear the word chair. I will only say, think in my mind, chair, that person will hear it in their language. The meaning of what it is, is conveyed just because of the world of ideas. A very important point. Now, what is the normal means in our astral bodies? How do we communicate with each other? Do we shout at each other? No, because we do, don't have any physical body. We only have sense perceptions. We can try to shout, but nobody can hear it. So communication is by thinking of something. When you think of something, other person understands. We call it telepathic communication. It can also happen here. Some people say, I can communicate telepathically with people. What they are actually using is a normal thing all of us have. We all have the capacity inside us to communicate telepathically, but we are confining ourselves to physical awareness. If you open up that awareness, we can have telepathic communication. Now, some of you may have telepathic communication, you will know 
when you think of conveying a message in your language, other person can hear it in their language, even telepathy here. So that's why there's a big difference. This whole idea of the soul practicing the, the beauty of a creative world like this one, or any world, there's so many just created. But right now we're experiencing a small slice of it here. When we look at this world, we realize how much beauty there is. We can go and look at the vastness, billion, billions of light years away, which is going to be creating a problem for the, uh, for the scientists. I've been warning them for many years now. <laughs> well, why was I warning them? Because they said, this world as we see it is created from a big bang. That means there was nothing, no time space, nothing was there. And then, where did the Big Bang take place? Because they say it's spreading out. Everything expanding universe came from a Big Bang. My simple question was, where did the Big Bang start? Because if it has started at a particular point, then the point already existed. So time and space were already there. If there was no point, where did it start? Where did that Big Bang occur? So they tried to find out in the last 50 years since this Big Bang theory was proposed. They say you take any point here on the Earth, a single planet of a small solar system in a corner of the Milky Galaxy is the center of the universe. But if you examine the expansion of the universe, any side, all four sides of the earth is expanding on all four sides. Under normal laws of expansion, we are the center. But then they put the center a few thousand miles away, that was the center. And now they find a million miles away is also the center. They say the center has expanded. So that makes it very difficult to understand how a big bang occurred at a singularity, what they call singularity, and then it is expanding from all over. Pro problem is not there. What I warn them is that one day you will have telescopes to see. And when a telescope will see one million miles away, it won't see what is happening there now. It will see what happened million miles divided by the speed of light. The speed of light takes time. When we look at the sun, we are not seeing the sun as it is now. We are seeing it eight and a half minutes late. The sun's light takes time to come eight and a half minutes to come to us. So we are always seeing a sun later than actually it is. Supposing something is one year, light year away, we are seeing what was there one year ago. Now getting more telescopes that have just seen 4.5 billion light years away. According to the Big Bang calculation, they said the Earth was calculated by reversing the process of expansion. This is the rate of expansion, I go back at the same rate, 13 and a half billion years ago, the Big Bang took place. They've been saying this for many years. This means there was nothing 13 and a half billion years ago. That means if we go further and further back through our telescopes, one day we'll see a smaller and smaller universe and then we see the point of the Big Bang. As we have developed better telescopes, we see a bigger and bigger world, more and more galaxies. Where are they coming from? Soon we will reach with a telescope in science that will see 13.5 billion light years away at the point when the, when the Big Bang started. And they'll see such a huge universe and no Big Bang. So I've been warning them. It's just a matter of making better telescopes. And they are making it. Every year they're making better telescopes. Every time they make a better one, they find a bigger universe, more galaxies. Now the billions of galaxies already found. So science has confused itself. But some scientists were very, very wise. But they pointed out things at the last moment of their life. 
Einstein, for example, who accepted the Big Bang Theory. Just before he died, he wrote some notes. In the notes he says that he made a big mistake while calculating all these theories, theoretical models, relativity, special relativity, general relativity, everything he calculated was based upon what he observed. He did not take into account what the observer was doing during that observation. Why did he come up with this point? Because of the quantum physics that had come up in his lifetime. What is quantum physics? Quantum physics says that you can, with your eyes, look at something which is a wave and make it into a particle. A discovery that they are constantly repeating and it happens every time. So those of you interested in this scientific stuff, I can give you an example. There's a hydrogen atom, smallest piece of matter. When we talk of matter, matter is where you have a nucleus which is positive, electrons moving around it. All matter is made like that. Hydrogen has only one electron moving around the nucleus. So we call it the simplest matter. Helium is the next bigger matter. But let's go to the smallest. There is one electron. We have enough laser technology and photographic technology, electronic photographic technology, to even see a molecule. And we have seen the atom of hydrogen. And we have seen that the hydrogen atom ha has only one electron moving around at a certain distance which we know. And it's in orbit, going round and round. Is it going in orbit like this, or like this, or is it millions of other little, little places that it can go at the same distance? We don't know. If you point a laser beam of the size of electron which can be done today at the distance which is the electron distance from the nucleus you put one laser beam wherever you put the laser beam the electron is there whether it's there here once you find it there is nowhere else supposing you find two laser beams at two places the as you observe there are two electrons when you remove, only one is left. Our observation is changing all this. There are more experiments have been done now showing how the observer can change a wave into a particle. It started with light photons, how the photons were waves. That they could go, a single beam could go through two holes, it's a wave. If you measured it, it became a pro, uh, particle. Einstein recognized, but then he died. He couldn't work on this. Because this is what meta metaphysics has been saying, that our observation is creating this universe. Einstein hinted at it. There was another great scientist who recently died, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, you heard of his name? He was the next great scientist looking at the origin of the universe. Also Big Bang accepted Big Bang Theory, except, accepted the expansion of the universe. In the in last interview he gave, before he died, he said, I am still examining what was there before the Big Bang. For example, he said, even time was created by the Big Bang. What was there before time? And he came up with a remarkable answer to himself, to the interviewer. I think it was imaginary time. Before physical time came, I believe, Stephen Hawking says, a scientist, it was imaginary time. Then he explained what he means by imaginary time. He says, when we are in good company, and it looks like only 15 minutes have passed, the clock says two hours have passed, 15 minutes is imaginary time, and two hours is physical time. Almost confirming that our imagination is creating physical time. That's the one that was before this, this thing was born. There was imaginary time. That imagination pre-existed. 
the very thing that the mystics have been saying. And then he died before he could explore any further. But these great scientists have left something which they picked up from there only. They picked up this awareness from the same place from where we pick up all inspiration, all inventions, all ideas, all concepts. We pick up from there, all of us. They picked up from there. So it's very interesting to examine how things that we experience here have been generated from inside. The best way to enjoy the show is to see all the levels. Just go explore. It will be worthwhile. Don't say, oh, I have other obligations, I don't have time for meditation. What are you meditating for? <coughs> meditation won't take you to your true home, but can give you a lot of fun, can show you a lot of stuff. And it's very interesting, people say, I wish one day I could fly to the galaxies and see other galaxies. I want to see if real life exists in other galaxies or not. I want to see other planets. With this body, we can't go. In the time frame in which we live, we can't go. But with the astral self, you can go and see it. There are so many universes in which life, like as we know it here, is existing. You can't say exactly like this. Because if you go, some of you might have gone and seen. There are some different rules, laws of nature are different. We think they are standard laws of nature because we are used to them here. And we believe other galaxies, if life is there, there will be the same laws of operating. They don't. Some are more advanced. Supposing we go back to a life that is just forming up <clears throat> and people are catching stones. Great discovery! I put two stones! It was as great a discovery for them as a software engineer coming today and saying, I found a new software. Two stones will mean nothing to us here. It meant the same excitement when that was the only area of development. So that is why there are some universes way ahead of us. At least I can mention one universe somebody has experienced where a gadget exists to control your movement in time. We can't do that here. This is also a baffling statement for scientists. If space and time are one continuum, which all our scientists are now accepted, not only Einstein, all scientists are today physicists are accepting. It's a law of physics now. Time space is one continuum. The dimensions of time Dimension of time is only one more dimension from height, weight, width, whatever you call the other three dimensions. It's a fourth dimension of space-time continuum. Okay, if that is so, if time-space is one thing, in space I can go there and come back. Why can't I do it in time? They're still baffling the scientists. If it is one, we should also go to tomorrow and then come back to today. If it's one thing, you should be able to do exactly what you do in space. And they say, what is stopping us? Why is time one directional, space in two directions? But they don't know. There is a universe existing. The time is also two dimensional. You go to, we can go to tomorrow and come back to today. Just like you can go away there and come back here. An actual universe exists. Where they just mastered one little thing. For them it's nothing at all. They think it's natural. They believe it's a natural thing everywhere in the universe. And we are so wondering about it. Why can't we come back, go back to the future like they say, go back to the past? And they are doing it all the time. And it looks so natural to them. Like supposing we are walking, two friends walking here. One friend walks faster and goes ahead. They say, I'll catch, catch up with him when he's waiting somewhere. Normal thing here. Why can't we do it in time? They do it all the time. Okay, I'm going tomorrow, I'll wait for you. You join me up. You come a little faster, you join me up. Normal in another universe. The laws are different. It's not only in the physical universes that you'll find this variation. 
And by the way, you could travel to those universes in the astral plane. Look at the fun of traveling, flying in an in a astral meditation. Wonderful thing. For people's curiosity can be fulfilled in so many ways. So I don't think that meditation is useless. I think it's a good occupation for the mind. It's a good way to have fun in this created universe. And good to go to these levels and to see, for example, to go to causal level and see the variety of destinies available to, for us to pick up. Like going to a DVD store to play movies. We pick up what we like. Then we go pick up a life what we like. It's a, it's a very big thing to, to have an actual experience. But we're sitting here in the physical body, trapped. We are trapped in the physical body. The trap is nothing but the distraction of the mind to an outside experience. That's all. We are totally distracted. The mind is interested in nothing but what is created outside. It's not willing to experiment with itself. It doesn't want even to see what it is. It doesn't want to know what the mind is, who is powering the mind, who is giving life to the mind. It doesn't know anything about the soul. Forgotten the very origin of the self. Instead of saying, mind should say, let me know who is giving me the power to think. I should try to understand who is giving me power, how am I alive? And body should say, how am I alive? Where is life coming from? Life is not coming from the mind, it's, not, it's a thinking machine. Life is not coming from sense perceptions. These are experiences of life. Where is life coming from? No, we've forgotten. We don't even know it's the soul running the whole show. No soul, there'll be no mind. No senses, no body. It's a fundamental ingredient of life itself. And how do we talk to people? I think so. I think it should be done. Who's that I? That's not yourself at all. That's your mind. We have identified ourselves with the mind so strongly that we think that we are the mind. How could you be worse slaves of anything than this? Total slaves of the mind. And mind was supposed to be our servant, to service us, to help us. We were supposed to use the mind, not become the mind. So what has mind done? Such a strong hold on us and we don't even realize it. When I came first time to this country, I talked to some professors. I came to study at Harvard University, so very competent professors of psychology, professors of philosophy. So they discussed, you know, they talked to me like this to start with. You know this mind-soul stuff, whatever you talk of. <laughs> mind-soul stuff you talk of. As if it's the same thing, doesn't matter. How have you identified yourself with the mind so completely? Just because he's using a particular instrument is like saying, I'm the computer. Mind is no better than a computer, I can tell you. It functions like a computer. Go and look, examine it inside. The input, its processing is just like that. The data it processes exactly like that. It's just an organic computer inside. Memory, exactly like a memory we install in a computer. Of course, a lot of unused memory. And it's all stored in a physical being, a brain. All stored there. Another strange thing, why are we not using our brain? We use, they used to say 10% of our brain. Now they think it's only 5%. I think tomorrow they'll say 1%. <laughs> what is happening to 99% of our brain? What is happening to it? Okay, forget the brain. Take the basis of life, what they call DNA molecule. They say that's the basis of life. You can't have life without a DNA molecule. We don't know where it came from first time. They can't make it, they have not been able to synthesize a DNA molecule, which is life. The DNA molecule is huge in length. They say if you start writing it, one molecule of DNA, what it contains, they started writing, Jerome Project is doing that. It takes, two, uh, it takes two million pages of writing 
to write the complete sequences of one DNA molecule. And we are using a very small part of it. Most of it is black. A few sequences here and there. What is this game that we have been given some endowment, given something useful, and we're using so little of it? Because we are not aware of it. We can use the same things. When I say let's travel to another universe, what are we going to use? The same mind. The same in the same brain, in the same human body. We are not using anything. And still we made them our masters. We are the slaves. The computer runs our life and makes decisions for us. Some people say <clears throat> we have to make decisions in life. If we can't make it with the mind, how do we make it? I say there are two ways of making decisions, not one way. You can make a decision in life with your mind. You can make a decision in your life with your soul. How do you make a decision with the mind? Think about it and see what is better. Decide. How do you make decisions with the soul? Whatever comes first, intuitively follow it. We have both options there. Intuition works all the time, telling us what to do. A gut feeling, something. This has to be done. This should not be done. Just occurs without time inside us. Then the mind argues, no, 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 that is a superstition. No, no, don't do this. It doesn't make sense. The mind is always trying to tell us what makes sense. And next day we are regretting. I wish I had heard my gut feeling. I wish I had followed that. Every day I hear people say this. Yet we don't use it. We say we should develop our willpower. The stronger we are, the stronger willpower. Willpower makes us strong. Not bodily strength. People are very bodily strength. They fl fall flat if they don't have willpower. If you're strong, a small person can be very strong and can face the world. The strength is in the willpower. And willpower is also two kinds. Mental will, spiritual will. We are constantly developing mental will, ignoring spiritual will completely. The people say, we don't know. We know how to develop mental will by persisting in doing something, practicing it over and over again. We develop mental will. How do we develop spiritual will? Very simple. If you ignore mental will, it's spiritual will. It's as simple as that. If you can say no to the mind, Frequently enough, not all the time, three, four times a day, or even three, four day, times a week. You can tell the mind wants something very bad. You say no, your will, spiritual will will develop because only spiritual will can say no when the mind wants something very badly. Just try it. Then spiritual will builds up, your life changes. Mind becomes your slave. Then you direct the mind what to think. Tell the mind what to do. Right now we are asking the mind what to do and going by the mind's advice all the time which leads us to so many problems. So that is why it's a good idea that to follow the spiritual path, follow the simple elementary principles, develop awareness of your true self, your soul. That, that has given life and consciousness and awareness to you. That's made it possible for you to have a life. It's a great thing. And if you can meditate and at least go through two, three levels that are available through meditation, go there, find out. And if you are lucky, and if you are seeking is strong enough for going beyond, you will find a perfect living master. If you are seeking is strong, that I want to go beyond the mind to find the true soul, and just this awareness, this strong feeling, will bring a perfect living master into your life by coincidence. You don't have to go run around finding one because you can't find one. There are no special signs to find one. If there were special sign, supposing perfectly masters came with the, uh, with the letters P L M written there. <laughs> People use this word P L M quite a bit I hear. If that was though, then you know what will happen? If one PLM comes, there will be 20, 30 others 
just painting PLM. <laughs> and that's actually happening without painting PLM. There will be one perfect living master and there will be several others around there in the same area who are not perfect masters. Many completely fake, some who have done some homework and have gone to some mental stages inside. This has been the history all over. So that is why go within, check it out. Masters will come into your life by coincidence depending upon what you seek. You seek the highest, you will get the highest. I'm very happy that you joined me today again and we had these two sessions today. We'll keep on having these monthly meetings and whatever you pick up from these meetings, practice. Don't leave it here just as a talk, as something interesting. My wife thinks that uh, our meetings are only for social get-together. <laughs> she told me so. She said, I know they are only social get-together. I said, how do you know? What she did was an experiment that uh, we used to meet in Bruce, Wisconsin, where we were building that new con conference center, and she would invite six or eight or ten people whom she likes in the group. Others they say, I don't invite these hippie types, but I invite these. <laughs> and she has some idea. So she would invite them to dinner, and every day a different group. So at the end of the dinner, she would ask them, how was my husband's talk today? They would all say, wonderful, very good. What did he say? And nobody would answer. <laughs> See, I told you, they don't hear you. They came for their social interactions. <laughs> so she tested out many times. And I want to tell her, now they started for listening to me, what I say, and they're also following it. But she's going to test again. Please remember if you are picked up for the dinner. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me. See you next month.